Thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Simon Glazier uh, and I'll be hosting the session and discussion today. Before we do get started, just some brief housekeeping. Uh, we're planning to go for about 40 minutes today. Uh, and if you have a question or would like to ask a question, you can submit via your Zoom portal. And we'll do our best to incorporate throughout the session as we go. Uh, but hopefully we'll have some time at the end to cover off anything we don't get to. Uh, and also a reminder that CPD points will be available post today's session. As long as you stay with us throughout the session, they're usually ready and available within 10 business days. Uh, to set the scene a little bit today, you know, we've had a number of questions come through from you all. So thank you very much for that. You know, and combined with a number of conversations, conferences are back. So we've had a lot of interactions with advisors and clients over the last couple of months and so much information flying around right now. Uh, but there are a few themes that, that are consistent and top of mind. You know, rising rates off the back of inflation pressures, both domestically and globally. China cutting rates to stave off a property debt crisis and a zero COVID policy. And a recent earnings season with, again, you know, some clear winners and losers and just, just general uncertainty and volatility in markets. So when it comes to investments and client portfolios, it seems that cash really is the only safe haven. And you know, at least now it's providing some level of return, albeit still quite, quite small. And again, in saying all this, you know, some long-standing fundamentals continue and worthwhile reinforcing, I think, uh, and definitely worth reflecting on. And that is diversification is really the only free lunch. Uh, long term, take a long-term view and invest in that way. You should, still, you should sell stocks when others are greedy and buy them when, that, when others are fearful. And valuation matters. So we might cover some of these themes today. So uh, in light of today, and while we're here today, joining us, we have Casey McLean, our current director at Equ of equities in our Hong Kong research team, soon to be lead portfolio manager of the Fidelity Australian Opportunities Fund, and recently returned to Australia from our Hong Kong office where he was portfolio manager of the Fidelity China Innovation Fund. Uh, Maroon Yunus, co-portfolio manager of the Fidelity Global Future Leaders Fund based, based here in Sydney. And Anthony Schramm, portfolio manager for the Fidelity Asia Fund based in Singapore. And again, we'll be, we'll be aiming to shed some light on current views on the ground research from our research teams and gather insights from, today, from the team today on how they are navigating the portfolios through the current market events and what kinds of things they are keeping an eye on. So, Anthony, we might kick off with you, if that's okay. In terms of the portfolio and what you're seeing in markets, what's top of mind for you right now? I think uh, very much the, the market up here centres around China. Um, you're still seeing a lot of news flow related to the property market. I think just given how critical it is to GDP growth there, um, so what are, you, what are you seeing? What are you doing? Um, early days, but kind of seems like you're getting a bit of traction um, with respect to restarts of property, mortgage repayments starting, contracted sales rising. Um, so again, it's, it's early days, but um, potentially where we're close to trough, if not maybe passing trough um, with respect to the, the property market in, in China. And again, it's, it's, it's an area that um, you'd say it has had a lot of negativity um, over the last, say, 12, 18 months. Um, part regulation and I think part near term, again, just seeing what's happening with, with global macro has, has scared investors as well. So that's an area of interest to me, just given how beat, beaten up the sector is um, with respect to um, sentiment, also valuations. And as I mentioned, you know, fundamentals look like we're kind of getting close to, close to trough. I think on the flip side, um, within the region, what, what looks interesting is just how India um, is kind of standing out. It's just uh, powered through kind of any macro concerns around rates, um, Russia, Ukraine, with with what's happened with oil prices. They've kind of dodged a bullet there by buying cheap Russian crude, and and uh, it's, it's been a massively outperforming market. So that's on the flip side, and, and we'll just see how it goes from here, whether there's a bit of rotation happening within the region. But that's Kind of what's front of mind and again just lack of ideas coming through in india given how expensive and well loved the market is appreciate that anthony it's a it's a really good start um no, no real i suppose easy answers at the moment but uh marina might throw to you same same question top of mind right now what's happening 
Yeah, so it's it's basically the uh, the inverse of of what Anthony's seeing in Asia. Um, if you sort of look at Europe and and the US, which is sort of the the two dominant regions from a global perspective, uh, there's a lot of complexity going on with the macro, and it's it's, um, it's actually peaking rather than troughing over there. So so for us, I think um, the core focus really, I think, if you can sum it up in one word, would be will be resiliency. Uh, so what we're looking for really is um, businesses that are resilient um, with their revenue streams, um, you know, so perhaps that they, they have um, non-discretionary type, um, you know, activities. Uh, we're also trying to focus on businesses that have resilient margins, um, whether that be through pricing power uh, to offset any sort of inflation or whether it be through uh, more variable cost bases and so they can sort of flex their cost base up and down um, as as the, the, the revenues um, uh, evolve. Also looking for resiliency in terms of balance sheets. Um, so, uh, you know, relatively low gearing levels that has a number of different um, benefits. Um, it allows you obviously to, to increase your survivability rates if we head into a recession and it sort of increasingly looks like, um, you know, the, the, the Fed may, may you know, eventually push too hard on the brakes. And I think that's sort of a key concern for us. So you, you, want, you want businesses that have higher survivability rates. You want businesses that are going to be less impacted by the rise in funding costs. Um, and then also from an offensive perspective, you also want businesses that have uh, the flexibility um, to be able to deploy, um, you know, the, 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 the ability to fund, uh, it, you know, opportunistic M&A if some of their competitors fall by the wayside or even uh, be opportunistic in terms of buybacks if, if stock prices, you know, take another leg down from here. So that really, I think, sort of sums up the, the key focus for us right now. Thanks, Bruno. Might dive into a couple of those things as we go throughout to, uh, throughout the session today. Casey, your thoughts? Yeah, thanks, Sam. And yeah, for me, I think in Australia and, in, and indeed globally, uh, top of mind is just how restrictive monetary policy settings are going to become uh, and, and what that really means for valuations and, and earnings. Um, I think, uh, you know, the, the, the Fed in the US, um, they're, they're going to be in restrictive territory by year end, um, even if core inflation has peaked there, you know, with last night's print. Uh, I don't think they're happy with the current settings and we'll want to get it back to the sort of 2% level uh, eventually. And similarly, I think, yeah, RBA has made it clear that, um, you yeah, know, price stability is their number one goal and, and really a prerequisite for uh, stable economic growth. So they're very intent to take the heat out of the economy uh, and, and are happy to see, you know, growth slow, employment weak and, and, and definitely um, uh, happy to see house prices decline as well. So I think you, you, you're in for, you know, old fashions of macro slowdown, that means, you know, downside um, risk to earnings. I think particularly, you um, cognizant of that in, in the consumer sector where, you know, obviously mortgage costs going up, petrol costs are going to rise with the excess excise tax coming back on, you know, energy prices very high and, um, and you know, even companies like Woolworths saying, you know, food prices haven't yet peaked as well. Um, and, and to me as well, I'm, I'm closely monitoring New Zealand um, as, as a sort of canary in the coal mine. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, the RBNZ um, reacted much earlier, rates have gone up much sharper, and that's really having a, it's starting to have an effect on the economy there with um, consumer spending declining, yeah, unemployment starting to rise and then house prices really uh, coming off quite quickly there as well. Yeah, thank you, Casey. And I think coming out of the GFC too, New Zealand led the way from a rates perspective and we soon, soon followed. So yeah, Canary in the coal mine, yeah, agree, interesting. And I might stay with you, Casey, if that's all right, given... Uh, your comments around particularly the RBA and, and views of the Fed and continuing to target that sort of two to three bound of inflation. If we think about the portfolio and in particular some of the sectors that, that you know, to quote Yumaroon, proved to be more resilient and, and offer some resiliency in, in portfolios, what are your thoughts there, Casey? Yeah, uh, I, I guess, you know, there, there's... Um... For me, I, I think one of the more resilient areas perhaps could be in the energy sector. And I guess I would um, contrast that with the sort of metals and mining sector. Um, yeah, and the reason, reason I'd say that is uh, I think uh, the, in materials, uh, there's particularly going to be uh, an impact from the Chinese property sector. 
And, um, you know, although, you know, they are cutting rates and the economy is quite weak there and perhaps could even be, you know, a FIFO economy first in, first out for the sort of global economy, um, I don't think there's going to be stim stimulus in the property sector other than, you know, putting a floor under the market um, because that very much aligns with um, Xi Jinping's uh, policy settings, you know, the common prosperity focused on the three big mountains of property, you know, education and healthcare. And um, that also, you know, property is for living and not speculating. So they're, they're, they're trying to uh, stave off a deep uh, crisis there, but are very wary of overstimulating. Uh, and, um, you know, stimulus is probably going to be directed in China more at um, infrastructure and particularly new infrastructure in, in things like renewables, uh, data centres, smart electricity grid. And so those areas are much less commodity intensive than property. So I think um, you know, in the near term with macro weakening you know, outside of China globally, um, I think there's risk in, in commodity stocks and so definitely focused on low commodity beaters there. Um, yeah, and on the on the other side of that coin, I think energy um, is is pretty well supported by the oil price. I think you know big upside is um, is probably constrained as well, and and I think um, even at the peak of the Russia Ukraine crisis, demand destruction prevented prices from going to 130. But at the same time, it doesn't mean um, it's going back to 75 or lower either, because you know OPEC has shown they're willing to step in and and control supply. And I think they're sort of comfortable in a, in a mid 90s or around that um, sort of level. Uh, and, and when you couple that with a sort of medium term uh, theme or constraint from ESG and sustainability concerns, which means no one's willing to invest in large projects, um, I think yeah, there's good support at that level. And um, you know, most energy companies are, are just printing cash uh, at those levels. And uh, there is significant dividends uh, on offer as well. Thanks, Casey. And Anthony, interested in, in your comments, um, you know, we've spoken about the property uh, market, you know, potentially going through a trough at the moment, but your portfolio is always concentrated on high conviction. And of, of recent, you know, months in particular, that concentration has increased. So for, again, from an industry or a sector perspective, are there anything, are there any insights you can give us there? Uh, in, in terms of further concentration of the portfolio, you're, you're right that the name count has reduced. Maybe if I pull it back, say, over the last six to nine months, um, rather than the last, say, one or two months. Um, it's been a couple of um, thesis playouts and, and some minor exits which were happening before that period of time. Um, what's happened primarily is um, two things. One, um, you know, mainly adding to... Uh, existing ideas within the portfolio. Um, you know, we've seen some exposures such as um, the China material name, so Beijing Oriental Yuhong, um, SK Shu, um, also something like Tektronik um, in, in the US. Uh, they've been relative underperformers year to date, but again, my mind frame is very much thinking um, over the next three to five years, particularly on the industry structure, and then trying to think about how the cycle's playing within that time frame. Um, so I think these kind of companies, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're facing increasingly tough operating conditions, but the read we're getting is that I think the competitive environment will be um, much better um, when you come out of this trough, read into that um, competitors going broke or cutting R&D and, and not being able to respond with new products, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, it, it's, it's really been um, mainly adding to existing um, positions in the portfolio. And as I mentioned, just um, funding that through um, some thesis playouts and, and exits, which were already occurring, you know, about nine months ago. Copy that. Thank you, Maroon. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'd, I'd, I'd firstly echo some of Casey's comments around energy. Uh, we've we've had a, an energy overweight in the fund for uh, about eighteen months now, um, both in traditional sort of oil as well as natural gas. Natural gas has sort of been a, a, a big thing, and one of our largest holdings has been Chenier, which is which has been a big beneficiary, particularly because of the um, uh, the issues in in Ukraine. Um, and and I am of the view uh, that you know, energy prices probably will be supported uh, for longer. Um, so so energy remains an overweight for us. Um, one area we started to add to um, in a big way at the start of the year was insurers. 
Um, so insurers basically operate on their own cycle in terms of, uh, you know, whether premium rates are going up or down, known as, you know, hardening or, or softening. Um, and insurers have, have had, uh, particularly in the US, have been experiencing a, a hardening cycle um, pretty much since uh, middle to end of last year. Um, so their premium rates are going up. Uh, the other thing about insurers is obviously they take your money in advance you know, when you pay your premiums um, and that sort of sits as a, a liability um, in terms of unearned income on, on their balance sheet and so basically they have um, you know a, a x amount of time until your um, policy period runs out for them to do whatever they want usually they invest um, the, the those those um, premiums in short-term uh, fixed income uh, for a long period of time, they haven't really been earning much money on, on, on those investments, given where yields are. But now that sort of yields are, uh, are you know, back up to healthy levels and continuing to go up, um, all of a sudden now these insurers are able to earn, um, you know, quite a bit more money on, on, on that sort of prepaid um, premium. So you've, you've got two uh, positive trends uh, for insurers' top lines um, coming from premiums and coming from yields. Um, and, and, and so that's really, really good. One thing I would caution though, insurers, um, you, you sort of want to delve into the credit quality of, of who they're investing in, uh, in terms of, um, you know, whether it's sort of uh, high grade corporate debt or low grade corporate debt or, or, or government debt, um, because what you don't want to do is, is, is load up on an insurer that's investing in a whole bunch of high yielding stuff. And, and if the economy turns south, then you sort of get a big spike in corporate bankruptcies and, and all of a sudden that, that search for yield um, turns out to be um, detrimental to them. So that's that's a word of caution on, on insurers. But, but other than that, uh, insurers have been sort of an attractive area for us. And then I guess traditional uh, business models that, that we sort of think, you know, can continue to um, do well despite the macro. And I sort of um, hinted at that, you know, resilient non-discretionary type. So consumer staples um, and healthcare that are not you know, biotech um, exposed uh, because biotech um, tends to rely quite a bit on, on on capital markets for funding. Thank you, Maroon. And uh, Anthony, you, you've you've made some comments on portfolio transitioning over the last six to nine months. So we might focus on that a little bit. But before we do throw back to you, Anthony, uh, Maroon, the fund has been, the global future leader strategy has been going I think it ticks over two years in September, the end of this month. Um, how has the how has the portfolio morphed during that time? You know, be it in response to what we're seeing in markets, whether it be uh, rate rises, inflation pressures, etc. Just to give everyone some some understanding of how active the portfolio actually is. Uh, yeah, it, I mean, it's, it, it has morphed quite a, quite a bit. Uh, if you sort of go back to September twenty twenty. Um, it, you know, we were sort of coming out the bottom of, of the COVID lockdowns. Um, it was a massive junk rally, junk led rally, uh, because there was just the whole wave of stimulus sort of coming in. Um, we, we started to increase our cyclical exposure uh, at that point in time, remaining on the quality end of the spectrum, uh, I might add, rather than sort of chasing junk. Um, but it was definitely more on, on, on the quality end of the spectrum. Um, some, some cyclicals via industrials, uh, I mentioned sort of energy. Um, so we, we basically started to build up an energy overweight position uh, towards the end of 2020 and heading into 2021. Uh, and we basically maintained that um, all the way through. Um, and we've sort of trimmed some of that. We started to trim a little bit of energy at the start of the year before Russia and, and Ukraine, um, uh, but we've sort of maintained a, a, an overweight position since then. Um, and then really just concentrating on, on stocks that we like. Now we're sort of moving more in towards stocks that we feel like you know, can, can weather um, any potential macro storms. Um, but the turnover, particularly over the last six months, has actually been quite low. Um, and I think that's a, a testament to, to the fact that we're quite happy with the, the balance of the portfolio and, and, and how it's positioned. And we feel like we have um, quite a bit of um, you know, reasonably good defensive exposure in there that and, and, and you know, high quality from cash generation, from good management teams, and from the ability to sort of um, scoop up competitors, um, you know, who, who potentially may, may fall into trouble. So uh, right now, we're not doing a whole lot, um, primarily because we're quite happy with, with how things are. And so, and so we're looking really to add a bit more to, to the names that we have. Um, but yeah, definitely has sort of evolved quite a bit of, over that, you know, two year time frame. Thank you. It seems to be a, a, a constant theme and just, you know, 
reinvesting or increasing conviction in existing holdings, which is which is good. And Anthony, back to you for a, a second. And we have had a, a question come through, but something that we've sort of flagged as a topic anyway, particularly around TSMC being a heavyweight or a significant position in the portfolio for some time. Just interested in your views around the, the semiconductor landscape, in particular, you know, when you've got um, countries like the US trying to increase supply uh, and even onshoring of semis more broadly, how do you see that potentially evolving or impacting the portfolio? Oh, in terms of how you see it impacting the portfolio, I think um, maybe two aspects, one at the company level and the second one at geopolitics. And uh, maybe thirdly, I mean, Casey, um, pretty close to the tech space, so he might want to chime in as well with some comments around that. Um, but, you know, at, at, at the geopolitical level, you know, I think there's a, a, a lot of concern that, you know, um, China may invade Taiwan or relations may get a little, little bit tense. Um, you know, it's kind of not my base case that that you'll that you'll see a see a war there. It's more, I think, China will just chip away, chip away, chip away over time for incremental advantage, um, which is you know what they've done thus far. If you look at um, what's happened within the region, and from a portfolio perspective, um, you know, TSMC is, is a decent percent of the NAV, but as an active position, you know, it's substantially less. It's, it's pretty circa three hundred basis points, and then you just bring it down to, well, you know, kind of at the country level, how exposed is, is the portfolio? And, and you know, if you aggregate China, Taiwan, um, you know, it's a single digit overweight for, for the Fidelity Asia Fund. So if, if you know, basically all hell breaks loose um, tomorrow, unfortunately, you know, I don't think it would be, you know, dramatically, uh, um, you know, I don't think you'd see dramatic effects on the portfolio because there'd be other swings and roundabouts in the market to kind of compromise some of that negativity that you'd, that you'd see coming through Taiwan, China. So that, that's kind of how I think about it geopolitically. Just drilling down earlier, what I mentioned at the company level, um, you know, TSMC is, you know, looking at building fabs um, in offshore markets. I think a lot of that is, um, you know, government demand, but, you know, also they're at the leading edge node, have an effective monopoly there. Um, what we're seeing thus far is, yes, they're spending CapEx in, in places like Arizona, for example, but margins aren't declining. Um, revenue growth outlook uh, continues to be robust and, and surprising on the upside. And, and the CapEx that they're throwing at the business is getting you know, digested and, and, and spitting out good returns. So um, I think as the business has changed over the years, um, they've become a lot more competitive, as, as I mentioned, kind of extended the lead over, over um, companies such as Samsung Electronics, which I think are struggling a bit more particularly at the leading edge node. So uh, that hopefully addresses some of the questions around um, the weighting in the portfolio, company specifics and, and geopolitics. And um, not sure if Casey wants to maybe chime in with, with some other comments on that. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll, I'll throw to you, Casey, in a, in a sec, but I suppose just wanted to highlight before we do that, Anthony, that intra-stock correlation in your portfolio is something that always comes within the conversation and if if you're on the call and interested worthwhile having a look at that and to your point anthony there's no one sort of stock or one theme that's going to be impacted more broadly it's it's a well diversified portfolio even though it's high conviction so casey sorry a tech tech comments from you yeah i think uh there's sort of two forces at play you know, anthony sort of touched on one we're, we're definitely in a, in a down cycle for semis um, across the industry right we had a perfect storm on the upside where demand was very strong you know, a lot of uh, demand was pulled forward in things like PCs for work at home, um, et cetera. And, some, and a lot of that is sort of normalising. Uh, but you need to split the market into sort of the tier one, which is TSMC and, and virtually standalone in tier one, like, like Anthony mentioned, um, and then the tier two and other players. Um, so I think TSMC is going to see some softening in utilisation. Uh, but, you know, they have the benefit of being at the leading edge, bringing on new nodes, which is you know, smaller nodes, greater transistor density, which means ASP upside, and they do have a virtual monopoly there as well. So they're going to continue to grow through the down cycle, whereas some of the other players who are going to see a much bigger decline in utilisation, their price increases that they're able to get through for the first time ever in the, in the last up cycle will go away. And um, so there, I think there's uh, a lot more downside risk in them. And then TSMC is trading you know, on, on uh, low teens PE, which is about one and a bit standard deviations below its historic mean. Margins have, have structurally increased as well there as well. So I, I think it, um, although there might be some you know, softness uh, coming up now, the long-term thesis in TSMC has not uh, changed at all. And 
I think the fact that Intel, who was a former leader, is now outsourcing to TSMC is, is testament of that strength. Yeah, I mean, just as a consumer and obviously reader of the news, there's still some pent up supply, even if you just think about automotives and the fact that new cars are coming out with less technology than the previous model, all based on you know the comments around shortage of of chips, etc. Um, yeah, thank you for comments. Uh, that's really good. And uh, and you know we talked about it there, Casey. You are a tech analyst uh, throughout Asia, so. Something that I'm keen to hear from you all on is the engagement with the research team, uh, both domestically and globally. What what are some of the insights that they're they're bringing to you now? What are some of the ideas they're they're really focusing on, and how do you interact with the teams more broadly? Casey, I might stay with you. Yeah, yeah, great. I mean, um, I mean, the the key things I'm sort of focusing on at the moment, I guess, is you know, the potential downside risk to earnings in, in, in companies. So, you know, as sort of Maroon mentioned, after that resilient company with, you know, sort of strong visibility and growth, strong balance sheet with strong cash flow. So testing the downside risk in, in um, some of those uh, companies there. Um, and the other thing is just sort of separating the COVID winners from the COVID losers. Uh, and I think, you know, healthcare is is one area particularly focused there because you could easily split the, that sector into two camps, you know, those that have benefited from COVID and there's going to be a big normalisation coming and then those that are hurt by COVID and, and probably have upside risk from that normalisation. So, you know, these are companies where elective surgery was impacted uh, or, plas or collections, plasma collections have declined uh, and all the facilities were taken over by COVID patients. And, and indeed, you know, their, their staff costs have ballooned as well because you often had duplication in, in that as well. So um, I think, you know, some of these companies with, you know, visible strong earnings and are going to benefit from a normalisation, they're, they're the ones that are really delving into the opportunities with the analyst team now. Thank you. Maroon? Uh, yeah, look, I, I don't think our engagement with the analyst team has, has really changed, um, perhaps, you know, little areas of focus, but, you know, we, we have a very methodical and, and, and sort of systematic process of engaging with the analysts. Um, you know, every single week we're sort of catching up with between two and, and, and three analysts globally around the world, going through um, their sector, going through the stocks they cover, um, looking at uh, the overlapping names, you know, in, in the portfolio that they cover. Um, uh, and, and then basically same sort of thing as, as Casey said, you know, testing downside risk, uh, because that is sort of, you know, front of mind for us right now, um, given sort of where, you know, the trends in, in US and Europe are going. So, and the last thing you want to do is, is, is be surprised, you know, in, in the midst of a crisis um, about a particular point of vulnerability that you know that one of the companies had. Um, so what you want to do is is literally go through uh, with a fine tooth comb every single company um, potential points of vulnerability, the you know the areas they're exposed to, the areas that could see quite a bit of downside, and you want to make sure that you're capturing that risk um, and that you're aware of that risk um, and that you're being you know properly compensated for, for for taking on that risk. So we're always looking at the stocks that we own. We're also going through with analysts and, and sort of looking at um, you know higher conviction names in their space that we don't own that we could own, um, and then you know brushing up on those um, either. Uh, you know, doing a, a deep dive or, or, or sort of just sort of keeping in front of mind there. Because the other thing you want to do is also have a short list of candidates. Um, should, you know, the markets take another leg down, stocks that perhaps you've you've always wanted to own that you, you, you know, perhaps found in the past that were, you know, perhaps a little bit too pricey, they may come into, you know, that that sort of sweet spot where they where they hit your buy zone. So, and, and you don't want to be doing the work at that point in time, because you don't know how long that window of opportunity lasts for. So I think you want to do the work up front. And that's what we're sort of doing right now. So looking at the names that we own, and then looking at names, you know, that could be in that next tier that we don't own that we could own if sort of conditions uh, present themselves and, and, and sort of making sure that, you know, we're, we're, we're on top of that. Thanks, Maroon. Thanks, Casey. And in terms of uh, that focus on downside, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that's always, always the discussion with the analyst team. Is that fair to say, Anthony? Yeah, so from, from my perspective, you know, going through the process and, and looking at um, companies with, with analysts, it's, it's very much, um, you know, I tend to like to focus on, on 
more of the more of the risks and, and what could go wrong, um, especially when you you know looking at the the buy ideas, um, and therefore it's it's kind of a, a little bit of what Maroon was saying. It's, it's it's trying to peel the layers of the onion and 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 um, try and shoot down the buy idea. And if you can't kind of shoot down the buy idea, then it starts to look really interesting. So, you know, things that come through in in, in my process and what you look for is. Is balance sheet strength and then kind of the next layer would be well you know what currency is the dead in and then you know is it fixed is it floating and so on and so forth and earlier on in the conversation i would have made reference to things like the industry structure how that's changing um is it improving deteriorating etc so um yeah very much uh from my perspective trying to trying to ascertain um downside and, and risks and what could cause that and try to get comfort around it Yeah, thanks, Anthony. I mean, in terms of the currency, and I might stay with you for a, a little bit, how much does that come into play, particularly now when you've got so many moves on either side? You know, from an Australian investor perspective, currency is always a question. Yeah, so from my perspective, you, you approach it two ways. One is, um, let's call it bottom up, so at the individual security level. Um, as I referenced, I mean, debt is one of those. The other one would be, for example, revenue. Are they heavy exporters? Are they more domestic consumption plays? Um, and then from a portfolio level, uh, what's the top down? Um, you know, are there any you know, potential um, inadvertent exposures there? Are you comfortable with what are the risk parameters um, saying in the quarterly fund reviews that we that we go through? For example, you know, if there's a one standard deviation move in, in, in the dollar or, or interest rates, um, you know, there's a theoretical sensitivity in, in that document and you kind of review that and make sure you're you're happy with it try and understand what's driving it um so from my perspective it's it's um coming at it initially bottom up at the security level taking a top-down view to kind of try and cover that off and and, and um ask yourself a you know level of comfort and then always in the back of your mind you've got some sort of scenarios that that you're playing with and and you know one of those that that i've been running with for a while is just continued rmb weakness and then that's kind of uh, you know what we're seeing year to date and and we'll see what happens going forward but you know continue to maintain that view and and um you know that goes into your thinking at the stock level as well yeah perfect thanks and and just on from a top-down perspective looking at your country and regional allocation the allocation to china taiwan is quite significant sort of around or over 50 percent for those out there that are that are currently a bit hesitant on any allocation to to china uh, around, whether it be around economic stability impact from the property sector like we've spoken to, uh, what would you say to those investors today? Um, in terms of the, the fund um, and, and, and the process, it's, it's one where, you know, you go or I go where you think the IDs are. And as I kind of mentioned earlier, um, it's, it's uh, I think North Asia is, is um, much more of a, let's call it a beaten up um, part of the region than, than ASEAN and India. Um, so again, it, it, there is that exposure, as you mentioned, um, I touched on the, the overweight earlier, and then it just comes down to risk versus reward. Um, you know, notionally it looks riskier, but are you being compensated for that? And in some certain circumstances, I think you are, and, and the fund um, is positioned in, in, in some companies. Are, are, you know, at the moment, are you looking to upweight um, China, Taiwan, North Korea? Uh, are there kind of, you know, similar to Maroon, either kind of an IDs list? Uh, 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 is there anything imminent there today? No, there's not, but you're kind of looking, you're doing the work. Um, so maybe to answer your question, it's, it's you know, um, you know, you, you go looking for where you think the best risk reward is and, okay, the risks might be a bit more elevated, but I think the rewards are there as well. Yeah, that makes sense. Appreciate that. Uh, Maroon, we might tact uh, a little bit. Um, clean energy, obviously there's a lot of growth uh, in that sector and in that market, how is the Global Future Leaders Fund uh, leveraging that that growth or that potential thematic within the portfolio? Yeah, so what, one of one of the larger holdings that we have is a company called Solar Edge. Um, so if you sort of think about solar panels, um, you know every solar panel that goes on the roof has, has got an inverter, which basically takes that um, solar energy and sort of converts it into a into a DC current that we could sort of use for appliances and, and, and consumption with, within the house. Um, the legacy technology uh, is something that's known as a string inverter, uh, where all of your cells and panels are sort of um, 
you know, organized in, in a string um, and, and sort of think about like the a Christmas lights analogy where if you have one of the bulbs go out, it sort of impacts everything else down, down the line. And so um, you could either have a faulty panel um, or you could just, just by um, the way they're positioned on the roof, um, you could have, you know, one of the panels being impacted by a nearby tree. And so there's a bit of shading on that panel. And so the way the string technology works is effectively you're only as good as, as, as your weakest link. So if, if one of the panels is impacted and, and, you know, the remainder are all receiving a lot of bright sunshine, your entire system uh, in terms of its power output um, is, is compromised. Um, and so what Solar Edge do, um, they have a technology called power optimizers and, and that they sort of sit under each, each cell. And basically they allow each cell to act independently. So if you have you know, a little section of, of your system being impacted either through mechanical um, faults or, or, or through you know, shading or, or whatnot, only that particular area um, is impacted in terms of its its energy output. Everything else that's still receiving, um, you know, complete sunlight and, and is operating at 100% efficiency will continue to generate 100% um, power output. So it really is a much superior technology. Um, these guys uh, are the leaders in in that power optimization space. There's another company called Enphase, which which do uh, micro inverters, which effectively address uh, the you know the same sort of problem from a, from a different perspective. Together, those two guys are taking share. Um, Solar Edge is the larger, but together, those two guys are taking uh, share away from legacy string inverters. And so, if you sort of think about solar penetration, particularly in, in a market like the US, which is um, a lot further behind than Australia is in terms of um, solar penetration in residential homes because they haven't really had the same level of government support um, uh, and subsidies that we've had. So, you know, that, that that's a long-term thematic there just in terms of increasing number of um, homes being penetrated with solar. You add to that the fact that these, uh, you know, superior technology forms are taking share away from string inverters. So you, you also have sort of a, another market penetration um, level on top of that. Uh, yeah, so in terms of top line trends for the next five, 10 years, um, that, that, that's, that's very attractive. It already generates right now very strong margins, very strong returns, um, has a really good balance sheet. So for us, um, a company like Solar Edge, they're, they're also getting into adjacency. So they're making batteries, um, they, they do software tools that you can sort of you know, manage your entire solar system. Um, so for us, it's got all the key ingredients, uh, you know, to, to be a very attractive long-term uh, holding for us. Thanks, Maruna. I love that Christmas light analogy. And to be honest, I've done, I've done, you know, one of my best Griswold, Clark Griswold impersonations at Christmas time many years ago, trying to find that bulb. I swear, unbelievable. Great, great, uh, great analogy. And Casey, to throw to you. You know, the uh, Australian is a strong metals and mining industry, as we as we know, but it's currently in the crosshairs from an ESG perspective. So how do you balance the need for materials and, and then a decarbonising world and a push to cleaner alternatives today? Yeah, I think, um, you know, it'd be very, <clears throat> very easy to split the, the commodity world in Australia into two camps. You know, the old, uh, old world polluting commodities where, you know, coal's the poster boy and well, it's not far behind, um, and then the likes of you know, steel or, or uh, aluminium on top of that, and then the the, the new world uh, future facing commodities, as some people call them, the ones that you know uh, electrifying the world through uh, renewables and EVs, um, thinking the likes of lithium and copper, nickel, cobalt, even rare earths as well, um, and it'd be very easy to to buy the latter and and just ignore the former. Uh, but I think, you know, there, there's also some going to be some great opportunities in, in the, the old world commodities because I think, you know, supply side is going to be constrained, um, particularly for, you know, the steel and aluminium, particularly in, in China as well. I think they're also working on developing green products, green steel, green aluminium, which is going to you know, come with a... Uh, a uh, carbon premium on on top of the existing products, and um, yeah, you know, some of these companies as well, they're working on uh, carbon capture technologies as well, and new ways of, of manufacturing as well. So, you know, I think there's there's great uh, long term growth potential in those future facing commodities, but uh, I think the the risk is just ignoring some of those old can, uh, old uh, world commodities as well. To keep an eye on both sides as you say and just conscious of time guys we're coming up 
we've just ticked over 40 minutes coming up to 45 so i might um just go around the grounds really for any any final thoughts any final comments and anything that we've missed that you want to mention today so casey back to you if that's all right yeah sure yeah no i guess um you know my sort of closing message is just you know focused on um you know downside risk in in particularly you know some of the consumer facing sectors and, and looking for those uh those companies that uh you have strong or visible growth as, as more of the emphasis than the strong growth now and, and, and are valued at, at reasonable levels based on that, that growth outlook. Maroon? Yeah, look, I'd, I'd, I'd say I'd definitely echo, echo um, Casey's thoughts there. The other thing I'd say is uh, try and block out the noise as much as possible um, because um, quite literally every day um, is, is, is got a different thing. And, and you know, we, we, we've, we've seen it last night. Um, you know, so the day before yesterday in the US, we had a pretty good um, solid market. Then last night, uh, inflation came a little bit higher than, than what people were expecting. And all of a sudden it was sort of, you know, back to, oh my God, the, the, the Fed's going to do another, um, you know, back to back 75 basis point hike. And, and you've sort of seen US markets being impacted heavily. So it literally does change day by day. Um, but but the actual underlying businesses themselves are not are not moving uh, on a daily basis uh, to, to, to that degree. So really um, try and forget the noise as much as possible um, and then just focus on the fundamentals, do your work, make sure you've got a balanced, um, resilient portfolio that can withstand macro weakness um, because the last thing I'm going to be doing is, is, is selling stocks um, you know, in, in opportune time. So... Do the work up front, try and ignore the markets. Uh, they'll keep doing what they do and then and effectively use it to your advantage by by picking up some some stocks along the way that that you've always wanted to, uh, that you've ne never had a chance to. Yeah, one of the I think definitely one of the takeaways is is trying to eliminate the noise for sure. Anthony, any final comments from you? I think I think it's pretty similar to what Casey and Maruna said. I might just say it in different ways. It's just um, the thought process for me is trying to think out three to five years. Um, again, that's similar to Maroon, just to ignore to a certain degree the, the short-term noise. I mean, you, you're hearing it, you're cognizant of it, but think longer term, you know, focus on, on stock picking. And, and, you know, there's a lot of concern out there about, you know, is there a recession? Will it be a global recession? Look, at the end of the day, the markets are, you know, pretty good discounting mechanism and, and, you probably shouldn't be worried about what to sell right now. It's more, you know, what could we look to buy? And, and that's kind of where I'm, I'm focusing most of my time at this particular point in, point in time. Well, thank you, team. Thank you very much for your insights there. And, uh, you know, to go back to those original tenets of diversification and uh, buying when others are fearful, et cetera, I think those all ring true and really have been reflected in the conversation today. So thank you very much for your time. And thank you, everyone that has joined us today. Uh, if you've got any follow-up questions, please reach out to the team. We'll send around some information uh, post the session today and keep an eye on your email for the CPD points. But please, thank you for joining us again and we'll be in touch and talk soon. Thank you.